Hello, friends. Welcome back. It's David Muller again. We're reading The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. This is chapter four. So to recap, in chapter three, Edmund follows Lucy into Narnia inadvertently, loses Lucy, but ends up running into the queen. And so they have just run into each other, kind of startled each other. And this is where we begin. Chapter four is entitled Turkish Delight. But what are you, said the queen? Are you some overgrown dwarf that has cut off his beard? No, your majesty, said Edmund. I, I've never had a beard. I, I'm a boy. A boy, she said. Do you mean you're a son of Adam? Edmund stood still, saying nothing. He was too confused by this time to understand what the question meant. Well, I see you are an idiot, whatever else you may be, said the queen. Answer me once and for all, or I shall lose my patience. Are you a human? Yes, your majesty, said Edmund. And how, pray, did you come to enter my dominion? Please, your majesty, I came through a wardrobe. A wardrobe? What do you mean? I, I opened a door and just found myself here, your majesty, said Edmund. Ha, said the queen, speaking more to herself than to him. A door from the world of men. I have heard of such things. This may wreck all. But he is only one, and he is easily dealt with. And as she spoke these words, she rose from her feet and looked at Edmund full in the face, her eyes flaming. And at the same moment she raised her wand, Edmund felt sure that she was gonna do something dreadful, but he seemed unable to move. Then, just as he gave himself up for lost, she appeared to change her mind. Oh, my poor child, she said in quite a different voice. How cold you look. Come and sit with me here in the sled and I will put my mantle around you and we will talk. Edmund did not like this arrangement at all, but he dared not disobey. He stepped up onto the sled and sat at her feet and she put a fold of her fur mantle around him and tucked it in well. Perhaps something hot to drink, said the queen. Should you like that? Yes, please. Your majesty, said Edmund, whose teeth were chattering. The queen took from somewhere among her wrappings a very small bottle, which looked as if it was made of copper. Then holding out her arm, she let one drop fall from it onto the snow beside the sled. Edmund saw the drop for a second in midair, shining like a diamond. But the moment it touched the snow, there was a hissing sound, and there stood a jeweled cup full of something that steamed. The dwarf immediately took this up and handed it to Edmund with a bow and a smile. Not a very nice smile. Edmund felt much better as he began to sip the hot drink. It was something he had never tasted before. Very sweet and foamy and creamy. And it warmed him right down to his toes. Is it dull, son of Adam, to drink without eating, said the queen presently. What would you like best to eat? Turkish delight, please, your majesty, said Edmund. The queen let another drop fall from her bottle onto the snow, and instantly there appeared a round box tied with a green silk ribbon, which when opened turned out to contain several pounds of the best Turkish delight. Each piece was sweet and light to the very center, and Edmund had never tasted anything more delicious. He was quite warm now and very comfortable. While he was eating, the queen kept asking him questions. At first, Edmund tried to remember that it's rude to speak with one's mouth full, but soon he forgot all about this and thought only of trying to shovel down as much Turkish delight as he could. And the more he ate, the more he wanted to eat. He had never asked himself why the queen would be so inquisitive. She got him to tell her that he had one brother and two sisters and that one of his sisters had already been in Narnia and had met a fawn there and that no one except himself and his brother and his sisters knew anything about Narnia. She seemed especially interested in the fact that there was four of them 
and kept on coming back to it. Are you sure there's just the four of you? She asked. Two sons of Adam and two daughters of Eve? Neither more nor less. And Edmund, with his mouth full of Turkish delight, kept on saying, yes, I told you that before, and forgetting to call her your majesty. But she didn't seem to mind now. At last, the Turkish delight was all finished, and Edmund was looking very hard at the empty box, wishing that she would ask him whether or not he would like some more. Probably the queen knew quite well what he was thinking, for she knew, though Edmund did not, that this was enchanted Turkish delight, and that anyone who once tasted it would want more and more of it, and would even, if they were allowed, go on eating it until they killed themselves. But she did not offer him any more. Instead, she said to him, Son of Adam, I would like very much to see your brother and your two sisters. Will you bring them to see me? Well, I'll try, said Edmund, still looking at the empty box, because if you did come again, bringing them with you, of course, I'd be able to give you some more Turkish delight. I can't do it now. The magic will only work once, but in my house, it would be another matter. Well, why can't we go to your house now, said Edmund. When he had first got on the sled, he had been afraid that she might drive away with him to some unknown place from which he would not be able to get back, but he had forgotten all about that fear now. It is a lovely place, my house, said the queen. I'm sure that you would like it. There are whole rooms of Turkish delight. And what's more, I have no children of my own. I want a nice boy who I could bring up as prince and would be the king of Narnia when I'm gone. While he was prince, he would wear a gold crown and eat, eat Turkish delight all day long. And you are much the cleverest and handsomest young man that I've ever met. I think I would like to make you the prince someday when you bring me the others to visit me. Why not now, said Edmund. His face had become very red and his mouth and fingers were sticky. He did not look either clever or handsome, whatever the queen might say. Oh, but if I took you there now, she said, I wouldn't be able to see your brother and sisters. And I very much want to know your charming relations. You are the prince and later on the king. That is understood, but you must have courtiers and nobles. I will make your brother a duke and your sister a duchess. Well, there's nothing very special about them, said Edmund. And anyway, I could always bring them some other time. Ah, but once you were in my house, said the queen, you might forget all about them. You would be enjoying yourself so much that you wouldn't want to bother going to fetch them. No, you must go back to your country now and come to me another day. With them, you understand. It's no good coming without them. But I don't even know the way back to my own country, pleaded Edmund. Ah, oh, that's easy, answered the queen. Do you see that lamp? She pointed with her wand and Edmund turned and saw the same lamp post under which Lucy had met the fawn. Straight on beyond that is the way to the world of men. And now look the other way. She pointed in the opposite direction. Tell me if you can see those two little hills above the trees. I, I think I can, said Edmund. Well, my house is between those two hills. So the next time you come, you have only to find the lamppost, look for those two hills, and walk through the wood until you reach my house. But remember, you must bring the others with you. I might have to be very angry with you if you were to come alone. Well, I'll do my best, said Edmund. And by the way, said the queen, you needn't tell them about me. It'll be fun to keep it a secret between the two of us, wouldn't it? Make it a surprise for them. Just bring them along up to the two hills. A clever boy like you will easily think of some excuse for doing that. And when you come to my house, you could just say, hey, let's see who lives here or, or something like that. And I'm sure that would be best. If your sister has met one of the fawns, she may have heard strange stories about me, nasty stories that would make her afraid to come to see me. Fawns will say anything you know. And now, please, please, said Edmund suddenly, please couldn't I have just one more piece of Turkish delight you know, to eat on the way home? No, no, said the queen with a laugh. You must wait until next time. And while she spoke, she signaled to the dwarf to drive on. But as the sled swept away out of sight, the queen waved to Edmund, calling out, next time, next time, don't forget, come soon. Edmund was still staring after the sled when he heard someone calling his own name 
and he looked around to, saw, to see Lucy coming towards him from another part of the wood. Oh, Edmund, she cried, you've got in too. Isn't it wonderful? And now, all right, said Edmund, I see you were right. This is a magic wardrobe after all. I say, I'm sorry if you like, but where on earth have you been all this time? I've been looking for you everywhere. If I'd have known that you'd gotten in too, I'd have waited for you, said Lucy, who was all too happy and excited to notice how snappishly Edmund spoke and how flushed and strange his face was. I've been having lunch with dear Mr. Tumnus, the fawn. He's very well, and the White Witch hasn't done anything to him for letting me go. So he thinks she can't have found out, and perhaps everything is going to be all right after all. The White Witch, said Edmund, who's she? She is a perfectly terrible person, said Lucy. She calls herself the Queen of Narnia, though she has no right to be queen at all. And all the fawns and dryads and naiads and dwarves and the animals, at least all the good ones, simply hate her. And she can turn people into stone and do all kinds of horrible things. It is she that has made a magic so that it's always winter in Narnia, always winter and never Christmas. And she drives about on a sled, drawn by reindeer, with a wand in her hand and a crown on her head. Edmund was already feeling uncomfortable from having eaten too many sweets, and when he heard that the lady he had made friends with was a dangerous witch, he felt even more uncomfortable. But he still wanted to taste that Turkish delight again, more than he wanted anything else. Who told you all that stuff about the white witch? He asked. Mr. Tumnus, the fawn, said Lucy. Well, you can't always believe what fawns say, said Edmund, trying to sound as if he knew far more about it than Lucy. Who said so, said Lucy. Well, everyone knows it, said Edmund. Ask anyone you like, but it's pretty poor sport standing here in the snow. Let's go home. Yes, let's, said Lucy. Oh, Edmund, I'm glad you got in too. The others will have to believe in Narnia now that both of us have been here. What fun it will be. But Edmund secretly thought that it would not be good fun for him as it would be for her. He would have to admit that Lucy was right before all the others and felt sure that the others would all be on the side of the fawns and the animals. But he was already more than half on the side of the witch. He did not know what the others would say or how he would keep it a secret once they were all talking about Narnia. By this time they had walked a good way. Then suddenly they felt coats around them instead of branches, and the next moment they were both standing outside the wardrobe in the empty room. I say, said Lucy, you do look awful, Edmund. Do you feel well? I'm all right, said Edmund. But this was not true. He was feeling very sick. Come on then, said Lucy, let's find the others. What a lot we shall have to tell them, and what wonderful adventures we shall have now that we're all in it together. Stay tuned for chapter five.